Can I ask you a question? Sorry. Right. So, <laughs> towards the categorical theory of quantum. No, it's not about. No, it's not about. Okay, the non logic of quantum computation. I decided not to present something half baked. So, instead of going to explain, it's not just fully baked, it's been burnt, committed, dashes in the spread, and others are getting out of it. The reason that I'm going to talk about kind of backwards looking. I was thinking about like everyone was, like when did you first think for catch? If I remember rightly, it's when you came to Oxford for a sabbatical in 2004, is that right? Three, four. <laughs> and I'm rooting through my big box of photos to try and find some pictures. <laughs> but I, uh, I couldn't find anything from Oxford, but I did find some pictures from the first occasion of Bel Air's workshop on selective techniques of quantum computing. Um, so here is our hero <laughs> presenting, indeed, this exact paper that Bob was just talking about. But, you know, as well as talks, there's also lots of uh, heated, not heated, but intense discussion about the foundation of quantum computing. And uh, Prakash also demonstrated some of his lesser known skills. <laughs> It was, a, it was a very exciting workshop, very exciting uh, time to work in it, because basically it was all uncharted territory. We were sort of blundering around in the jungle, going up dead ends and so on. But this was the sort of question that many of us were, were motivated to think about. Now, if you pose this question to a layperson, or even a physicist, <coughs> you probably wouldn't really know what you meant. Right? It's not obvious. But we all know about the Kohenauer isomorphism. It's the idea being that I have a notion of computation, in this case lambda calculus, which turns out to be the same thing as the proofs in this logic. And if we add on <coughs> some categorical structures, so like with Jim Lumbeck's name at the end here, we have this nice triangle. So in fact, the, uh, the motivated question was, can you make something of this form for a quantum theory? If we have this, uh, this idea of propositions as types, that means we say that proofs and programs are the same thing, right? So the, Propositions are the output types of your program. In particular, you can have different proofs of the same program, meaning different processes producing the same type of output. And when you have more computational stuff in the things, less interesting thing about the validity of the propositions rather than the relationship between the proofs. But from a more pragmatic point of view, if you have types, you want some useful information about the program coming from the type system. And in particular, you'd like to avoid at least some programming errors. When we were working on Quantumatic in the beginning days, this was a commonly said slogan. Unfortunately, the ML type system is not quite strong enough to guarantee that we didn't make any mistakes in the program. But we'd like something like this to be true. So the objective then is to write the word quantum all over this picture. <coughs> and since I have written the word quantum logic, I've been looking at a quick think about these guys, the work off of now we work on quantum logic. And the idea being that proposition is a yes-no question which would be answered by a quantum measurement. So the state is, uh, models this proposition if that state is in the blind space of the projector. And so you have the slides of propositions. But unfortunately, it's not distributive because in general, the projectors don't commute. And in consequence of that, you don't have a deduction theorem. So there's no adjoint to the conjunction here. And so you have no deduction theorem, you have no proof theory. And then you can't do anything like propositions as ties with this kind of project. So let's look a little bit at uh, quantum theory and see what properties it has that might help us to write down the right kind of logic. So the no cloning, no deleting theorems, I think everyone's familiar with this stuff, but when you see this, if you're uh, in the early 2000s, you probably first of all thought of linear logic. And people did, and still do, write down things with linear types, saying a quantum computer, which is a classical part and a quantum part, and the classical data will be duplicable, and the quantum data will not. And this is good as far as it goes, but it doesn't really go very far. And essentially, all this type system is doing is enforcing one of the laws of physics. It doesn't really give you any information about what's actually happening in the quantum part of the program. So remember, of course, we have this isomorphism from the function space to the tensor product. And depending on, so, so here we have unitaries, but these unitaries correspond to maximally entangled states. And properties like this are important, so we think of this teleportation protocol, we prepare a certain entangled state and project onto it, 
and by magic, you know, the output appears at the other end. But this will totally not work if it's not an entangled state. So just saying I have two qubits is far too weak a thing to guarantee any kind of properties, even for the simplest possible quantum program. <coughs> and even in the original teleportation paper, you'll find this little quote here. And the interesting part is the second part of the sentence. It says, by contrast, entangled pairs are an undirected resource shared between the sender and the receiver. So this makes you think that maybe you want to have not a function space, but rather the part in the logic. Let's just bear that in mind for a bit later. Obviously, things can be a lot more complicated than that. So you now have talked a lot about the one-way model. So here are the computational things that you can do with this gigantic quantum state depend on the structure of the state itself. So you need to really need to some logic, some type theory to talk about what's happening inside the point. Okay, so here is a sort of first attempt at it. So here's the, uh, the sort of hints, right? We, want, we don't want to have Cartesian product because entangled states can't be decomposed. You want to have a function type because this maps state duality. You think your general state setting will be linear because no form of leading. And somehow you want to talk about non-determinism. So again, in the year 2004, this corner got filled in by these guys. <laughs> this, uh, the seminal paper at Lix was before, and the idea was that the denotational semantics should be dagger compact categories with dagger byproducts. Uh, and this was a, a generalization of the category of Hilbert spaces. And so we have pictures like this. So this is the teleportation protocol in that setup. So there's a, 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 a qubit at the top, which is a person entangled in a state using the structure that we always have in such a category. This is the Bell state. We do some rebracketing, and then these four uh, maps here correspond to the four possible trajectories in the general basis of measurement. And we have four classical choices modeled by the byproduct, and then we distribute, and then we apply these corrections. And the idea of the correctness of the protocol comes down to the fact that it commutes with that. So we have <coughs> four copies of the initial state. Around the same time, uh, Paul wrote down this, this paper, which has lots of pictures like this in it. And since we're already thinking about linear logic, this is probably looking, if you have a certain kind of education, like proof net from that. Uh, let's remark that there is a version of this paper in the proceedings, but it is not the uh, 161 pages of the original paper. So, since we know what the categorical structure is, it's quite easy to come up with the rest of it. And the yeah, basic idea is, so with classical logic we have conjunction and disjunction, and the great insight of linear logic was to break these things up. So this is a multiplicative additive fraction. So now, two conjunctions, two disjunctions. And that's too, too many for my taste, so we'll just get rid of the conjunction disjunction distinction, and so have tensor and sum. Hence, tensor sum logic would be the one laws. <coughs> Not everyone liked it very much. So, <laughs> Professor Jarre's uh, opinion <laughs> was uh, expressed at greater length, saying that you witness a frank divorce between uh, logic and category theory, which tends to equals power is not absurd, blah blah blah. This remark illustrates the gap separating logic and categories that one should not try to crush upon the other, which I say, well, that's just your opinion. <laughs> so, um, so, we write down the tensor sum logic. It's uh, the Gensin system, right? So, we're thinking of this being almost the syntax of, of our archetype theory. Uh, so, it is basically mild with the self dual objects I showed you. Every proof corresponds to an arrow in a certain free dagger compact byproduct yada yada category given by these generators A. Uh, Conversely, every arrow in every category has a proof corresponding to it, and it's has cut elimination and cut elimination side. Great. However, it's uh, not very typical for a logic. So, for every formula A and B, A implies B is the variable sequence uh, with the zero proof. And because you can have so much duality in this logic that you can do self cuts, and therefore, the empty sequence is not just provable, but provable in uh, 
perhaps in many inequivalent ways. I mean, there's no avoiding this, right? Because this is what the structure of the category is. But these, uh, as soon as sure everyone knows already, these empty uh, sequence correspond to the scalars in the compact category. So I'll show you quickly the proof net syntax and uh, an example of this. So this will look familiar to everyone who's known from the graphical stuff, but it's not exactly the same. So we have premises, conclusions, and put output, unit and co unit, or axiom and cut, if you want to think in terms of linear logic, and then introduction <coughs> rules for, and elimination for the tensor, scalars. Uh, here we have some non logical axioms, which come from this category of generators. And then the additive stuff gets a little bit confusing. So we have left and right introduction rules for the plus, and left and right <coughs> elimination rules for the plus. But because I have this plus around, I can't represent the tensor unit as blank space, so I have to have a symbol for it as well. And since we have byproducts, we can add atoms together. And this is represented by boxes. The box contains a number of slices, which are proof nets, and the whole thing is recursively defined. I'll show you an example, which will make that a bit clearer in a minute. But the upshot is, you can do cut elimination here, and it's strongly normalizing. And the example, I think, will show you the way that the cut elimination process corresponds to the dynamics of executing a program that corresponds to this. So here we go. This is looking familiar. Here is a, a unit of the uh, entangle pair. There's some input. And here's one of my boxes. This corresponds to four alternative behaviors mediated by this plus symbol. So this is four projections of the cut basis measurement and the four injections tagging these as separate classical choices. Similarly, we have the corrections here. So now these are the four elimination rules for the plus and four unit trees again from the four category generators. And so this is the whole application protocol. And I'll just quickly rip through cut elimination of this. So the first thing you have to do is open this box. So multiply it. So you get four. Uh, and now if we look inside here, we can see the stereotypical picture from a compact category, or uh, the basic case of cut elimination of proof nets, that goes away. I should really open this box now, so I don't want to draw 16 proof nets on the, uh, on the board. So I'll note that I have, going into this, uh, this plus dot, you can't really see here, it's dual. So I have, as one of my cut elimination steps, this coherence thing, it says that if I have the same injection being the same projection, then I just go to a line, but if uh, they are different, then the entire slice is deleted. So that means instead of having 16, I only have 4. So this is the 4 that you get. Add a little bit of cheating. I'll say that I'll appeal to some equations from my category generators to get rid of these boxes. Okay, so we'll remove them, and now we have 4 copies of the identity exactly in the case of Samson's object. Is it church also? So here's the theorem, which is stated in the appropriate language. So P is a compact symmetric polycategory. That means P is a suitable collection of generators. Then there's equivalence of categories between the free thing, free compact thing, the byproducts that this generates, and the proof nets with those guys as non logical axioms. OK, great. Let's think about whether this actually works or not. So we have this diagonal map. It says I'm going to have. Something, I'm going to make a choice, right? This is a represented um, measurement. But we're daggers, so we also have the co diagonal, or in the byproduct world, we have the co diagonal. So you think that this should correspond to forgetting which choice you have. But if you transport this thing into the category of Hilbert spaces, that's not what it is. What you actually get is just simply addition. So instead of forgetting your choice and having some probabilistic thing, you get coherent superposition of the two choices rather than probabilistic mixing. So, yeah, this doesn't work. So for probabilities, we should really go and use Peter Salinger's CPM structure, which we'll talk about in a bit. OK. So let's forget the additive part for a moment, and just think what you've got left here. So this is what the normal forms look like. You have premises, which are just the elimination, sorry. Yes, the elimination rules for the connectives, which is only tensor. And introduction rule for the answer down the bottom. 
and then this guy, which is just an arrow from that PK. So it seems like this information here <coughs> and here is totally uninformative. And in particular, we're not saying anything useful about entanglement. So can we do anything better? So one thing to notice is that you can't hope in the category of five-dimensional Hilbert spaces to have an object corresponding to entangled states and different objects corresponding to um, separable states because the entangled states are not a subspace. However, you can do double blue and construct a different category on top of them. And this does separate the tensor and the power. So you get product states in the tensor, good. Power gives all states, which is not really what you wanted, but it's okay. Tensor is a subtype of power. Maybe that's acceptable. So can we push this, um, this definition further? So let's say a state S is called slot reachable if there's some sequence of stochastic local operations that translates one state into the other. So these things in particular can never create a tangle. And so if two things are mutually reachable, then they're slot equivalent. So for two qubits, there are only two small <coughs> classes, entangled, not entangled. For three qubits, there are six. In particular, these guys are inequivalent of being maximally, maximally entangled. And then we get to four, we're screwed. So now there is no, at this point I would say, let's just give up. We're not going to have a type theory to describe entanglement in any meaningful way. So let's just look at the terms themselves. Give up on types. Okay, but what will our language of terms be? I mean, the interesting point is the notion of equivalence of processes. So let's think about the term factors. So, one of the things we're going to exercise is the notion of an observable. So this the idea is that if you have some point of the you are allowed to copy big things if they're orthogonal, i.e. Mean, if they're the eigenstate of a known observable. So this was used to formalize what an observable was without referring to any linear structure. This was done by Bob and Dushko and Eric Paquet. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is you have a copying operation and a reducing operation, they're adjoints. And we obey all these equations. And that is the definition of a special commutative diagonal Frobenius algebra. This in itself would not be really interesting without this theorem, which says that in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, these things are bijective that corresponds <coughs> to bases, and therefore every such uh, algebra defines it on its own. Okay, not enough. <laughs> Sorry, we need more. This is probably going to be enough now. If we add in one more ingredient to our system, the notion of complementarity, which was explained in this paper, uh, I will note that we managed to get it down to 86 pages, and the word logic does not occur in the title. It's an improvement. Uh, this is the notion of complementarity. So, briefly speaking, two observables, two bases, are complementary if the inner product between every element of red and every element of green is equal and in fact scalar is one over the square root of the dimension. <coughs> More operationally, it says if I know perfectly A, I know nothing about B because all the outcomes are every probable of Okay. Um, we slightly strengthen the definition beyond what I said and we can show that using a, one of those Frobenius <coughs> algebras for one observable and a different color for the other one, you can show that we jointly form a bi algebra, meaning I'm taking the co right, taking the multiplication of one and the co multiplication of the other to form a bi algebra. In fact, you can then prove that don't form a bi algebra to form a hot algebra. Now, from this, an enormous number of interesting things happen, but I have not discussed them because it's the part of all. But I would claim that these interacting algebras are a fundamental new structure for computer science. So we have done lots of work using this, this equation theory to prove interesting things in quantum mechanics. But quite recently, Pavel Solchinsky and various collaborators of him have found the same structures in the world of petri nets. So this has suddenly surfaced again from, for completely independent reasons. So, okay, we have an equation theory. What is the actual syntax? The syntax will consist of graphs of dots. So, again, these correspond to complementary observables. They're labeled with angles. 
I will not show you the, the semantics of this, but there are some equations which are derived from properties I already mentioned, that many equations, which is not too many. So a very quick example of something you can do with this. I want to show, here is a term, right? This is a quantum circuit, and this is some input to it. In fact, this is the two qubit Fourier transform. And with the equations I showed you briefly, you can simulate the execution of this thing, and therefore derive the uh, Fourier transform that I input. So that's the Fourier transform. So this is like a good candidate to replace the lambda calculus in the world of quantum stuff. I didn't talk at all about probability anymore. There's two sort of, I would say, complementary ways for this to be formalized. One is used by Simon Perdri and I, which is using sort of external non-determinism, where you have labels on the, uh, the vertices which correspond to possible classical outcomes of some non-determinist process, I don't say what it is. Alternatively, you can do it essentially internally using uh, Selinger's CPM construction, which looks a little bit like this. I don't want to explain that, but what I will say is using this approach, we managed to prove that this notion of strong complementarity is equivalent to non-locality in the Marmon sense. Uh, so I think that justifies the claim that strong complementary is a fundamental notion in quantum mechanics. Using the other approach, the labels, Simon Pervi and I managed to prove some of the results that Elham mentioned yesterday, showing that you can reduce a complicated looking measurement based programs, this is a program in one way model, to a much simpler circuit, which is just a circuit. Uh, so this is effectively showing the correctness of this program. And in more recent work, we showed how to prove the correctness of an error correcting code, Staden's 7 qubit error correcting code. And you can see that this starts to get rather hairy, it's part of the proof here. And you would guess from these pictures that it is not, um, it's not been done by hand, right? Done with a machine. So I think Alex Kissinger should take most of the credit for work of Quantumatic, which is a graphical theorem prover, which can work in all kinds of graphical theories, but is especially optimized for this theory that I've been now, I think that is actually the end of what I wanted to say, except for this nice picture. So this is again from this 2004 workshop, and uh, you can see here Prakash, as he likes to be, surrounded by a group of adoring friends, <laughs> just, as, just as he is today. And if you, I don't know if you can see very well, but most of the people in this picture are in the room today, and I am very proud to be counted among them. Happy birthday, Prakash. Thank you. Just in the way that you commute Z and X, you pick up a factor of I in there. So, uh, usually, when you commute J, X, and J, Z, do you pick up a J, Y as well? Uh, we're not talking about the same thing. Ah, sorry. Uh, just think of these being the probably matrices themselves. Uh -huh. They don't satisfy the angular momentum in computation, do they? I don't. There is some algebra there that doesn't quite jive with what you're saying. I think it's all up to a global phase. Right, where you talk to Yeah. No, but when the, the commutators were angular momentum, right, they were basically cyclic law. So if you look at the commutators.
get a rotation and they then you should get J1. And on this side it's the same they commute up to some scale, so I don't understand exactly what's happening. Yeah, I'm not sure that I really understand the question. <laughs> Is there anyone else who doesn't understand the question? <laughs> 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 or have a comment?